welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. So good that you're joining us today. I'm in the booth with a really good friend, and we're going to have a great conversation. Like always, you can go to calvarybible.com, click your campus, find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. Get connected, stay connected here at Calvary, and one of the great ways you can do that is to go to calvarybible.com. We have a great summer ahead of us as a church, and we want you to jump in it. So make sure you're clicking that events page and finding out what is happening specifically at your campus this summer, because there's a lot of moving parts here at Calvary. And we're just so grateful, once again, that you're tuning in, and we're always prayerful for you these days. All right, let me introduce my good friend, Scott Thornton. How are you, buddy? Hi, Jay. Good morning. I'm good. How are you? Welcome to the weekly. I'm honored to be here. I'm so glad you're here, man. It's Very just fun. fun that have you in the booth today and uh, get to know you. Some of us who listen don't reside on the Erie campus, so yep. tell us a little about about yourself. Well, my name is Scott. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> I appreciate it. I am new-ish here. Although, if you've been on the Boulder campus, you may have seen me. That was actually where I, I came to know Calvary through a worship mentor of mine named Tom Ewing. Yep. Um, we share our last names, but no. Do you know Tom? Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. What a guy. Love Tom. Oh, love Tom I love Ewing. that man. He's been such an influence for me and inspiration for years now. Um, so, yeah, been in the worship world a long while. Ended up here because he wrote me in through the back door, as I tell people. Mm-hmm. I uh, took a season off for a while, and um, he encouraged me to come play with him one week. And so I stepped in a boulder, and uh, they had a need. Filled it for a while. Loved it. It was fun serving alongside Tom Shirk. I didn't know about Erie, Yep. period. And then uh, there was a need here. So I said, sure, I'll come and help out, see what happens. And... Uh, God's just been so good. I didn't think that I'd ever serve in a church again, and to be back and doing it has been such a joy. What a community that you have helped establish and so many others for years. Um, it's just a gift. It's a real gift to, to be a part. So, yeah, grew up kind of loving the church. My dad uh, always had a great, deep love for the church, never worked inside of it, but yeah. um, went to seminary. He's always been in Christian publishing, mm-hmm. um, so parachurch resource help and uh has loved jesus taught me about jesus and led our family towards jesus continues to do so um and uh all along the way um that grew my affection for the the people of god and the gathering and um so yeah a lot of my life was searching how i might be able to to be a part of it and offer some level of service towards that started in youth group way back in the day um, we were joking a minute ago about microphones and how I had one in front of me way earlier than I probably should have, <laughs> Yeah, totally. but it's all learning yeah. and it still is. Um, so yeah, there was a mentor of mine, uh, in youth group who, uh, took me under his wing and really discipled me and led me towards the things of God and, and grew again, that affection for the people of God and, and the gathering and, um, started serving youth group on a weekly basis and, all throughout high school, um, still felt just called to serve the church and loved it. I mean, yeah. it's just such a joy in it, such a sweet um, gratitude for what it offered me and my faith journey and um, just the significance of it. So um, served all throughout college, too. Uh, started as an intern at a church up north in Loveland mm-hmm. for a while and like I said, left there to try to take care of my family for a while and then uh, drove for UPS, which was a joy too. Yeah. Totally different kind of work. Um, never lost the love for the church though. Um, and so, yeah, to be here is just wild. It's been a yeah. journey. Man, it's so great to have you on this campus. You're such a gift to our community. You hold the title as Pastor of Worship Arts on the Erie campus, correct? That is correct. A lot fancier title than I think I deserve, <laughs> but yes. You know, yes. everyone's wondering, including Jay Ewing, what would be considered your favorite band of all time? Oh, man. Favorite band of all time. The one that you go back. Questions. You know, I grew up loving Switchfoot. Yeah. They were probably one of my first, like, rock and roll, but cool. Mm. They loved Jesus, and I knew that, but they were sneaky about it. Yeah. One of those kind of, like, crossover kind of artists. But depth of lyric 
uh, and just fun in their music. I right. think that's what I loved about that was it was loud enough to keep me entertained, um, but it was different and creative enough to keep me inspired towards like, ah, I like what they're doing. And it's yeah. a lot different than a lot of the other stuff that I kind of was listening to at the time. But I mean, I grew up the whole diverse kind of list of musical influences. Right. I remember listening to the Beatles early on with my brother. We got into their albums for a long time. Yeah. And uh, Coldplay later on, U2. Just these, you know, the greats, Jay. The greats, the greats. What yeah. about you? Your yeah. favorite band. You know, I've seen time. Switchfoot a few times in person. Actually, I prefer John Foreman on his solo stuff yeah, now as I've aged a yep. little bit, but I enjoy Switchfoot, of course. Yeah. Um, Beatles would be up there. My deep love for Beatles music yep. goes pretty far back. Um, you know, there's a lot of other great bands. U2 is another one. Coldplay, mm -hmm. we're sort of in the same camp, I think, yeah. musically. Yeah. But I grew up with singer-songwriters, sort of from my father and mother, listening to those type of bands. Yeah. Um, so those are sort of where I have always been drawn to. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Great lyrics. That's all I care about. It's a hard Great thing to do. Yeah. To be a writer, and I've I've really only barely dabbled ever in that space because of how great the people that I've listened to are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's intimidated me. Uh, but what a gift to be able right. to, and you mentioned John Foreman. I mean, specifically, yeah, that guy's a, he's a treasure. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, I, I have always been drawn to this great writing. So yeah, novels, books, yep. music, art, mm -hmm. theater, movies. If it has great writing, I'm in. Totally. So that's yeah. where I'm where my most only my jams are. Absolutely. So. Okay, so we're in a series of Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. You know, as a worship leader of a campus, your heart has to be tuned in a different way than I think most people is expect you just don't put some songs on the wall and say that's good for the week you actually have to be in tune to what the themes of the book are sort of where the preacher is going because worship is about getting the congregation ready to receive the word of god and yeah. to have an experience with god mm -hmm. so talk us through sort of your theological uh philosophical views on worship in light of even this series of Nehemiah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I love this series because it's been a reminder, again for me, of the significance of remembrance and remembering what matters the most. And when I approach a worship service, I think of the glory, the holiness of God, the, the standard of perfection that is in him and the worthiness of our king. Mm -hmm. The one that we gather for, the one that we gather under, and the one that we gather with. I mean, what a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. That the high king of heaven who set the universe in motion loves us enough to send a son, and then we get the joy as a church to gather together to celebrate his goodness towards right. us. And I love what Thomas talked about even this last weekend. In the W's, the, the work of God and the word of God and the ways of God. And I think that's even that as a framework towards worship is, is really good. It's all about God celebrating him first and foremost. And mm -hmm. we play a part in that story. And so there are many songs that I use personally in my prayer life and um, in my quiet spaces to, to be able to connect with God. But there's nothing like a congregational song that sings mm -hmm. vertically towards who God is, what he has done. Mm -hmm. uh, those songs of celebration to me are, are sort of the highest level. And so, yeah, in terms of approach and, and, and planning specifically, uh, the, all of these things come into mind. But if we don't start with God, who he is, then I think we're, we're off to a rough start. Right. And so uh, I, I try to think really um, carefully around what we before our people because what we sing is powerful and uh and our hope is that we carry it into our weeks right that our tuesday is impacted by we, what we do here on sunday morning mm -hmm. that this gathering space is um truly goes beyond just a an hour-long thing that we do mm -hmm. um and so the the holiness of god the character of god the person of god 
salvation of God and, and our place in his story. Um, I just think it all, it, it, it has to, um, it has to be theologically rich. It has to be scripture, God breathed. And there are so many tools, um, lyrically for us options i should say to be able to choose from these days it's a beautiful time to be a worship leader yeah i think back on friends of mine who who did it years ago and to think about the work that they went through even to prepare their their teams to Mm -hmm. burn cds for them and drive them to their homes and and print out physical music for them to be able to um, to practice along with and and now to think of some of the ease of that which has allowed us then to to really focus more on the pastoral ministry side of it and care for people. Um, That's right. While having such a broad spectrum of, of songs to choose from, and the pool continues to expand. And so yeah. what a beautiful thing that the songs of the saints of old can still speak powerfully into our place here in 2024. And there are still great writers out there yeah. that are bringing new spins on sacred text Mm -hmm. i think the methodology obviously over the years has changed but the message never does and so if if we can keep that at the core biblical authority Mm -hmm. um then i think there's a lot of creativity uh, room for creativity i should say in that space and i like exploring that i think that's a lot of fun yeah totally Mm -hmm. i i think it's a really good insight of how the methodology has actually made room for pastoral ministry mm-hmm. more. And, you know, and sometimes technology doesn't do that. Totally. But technology has done that in this space. And I think it's really important for us to be aware of that and be grateful for it. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, you, you've sang a lot of worship songs mm-hmm. over the years, a lot of things. What are some of the major themes that, really stick out to you, especially between worship songs and the book of Nehemiah? You talked specifically about sort of um, some of those already, but what are some major, just like, man, this song, this sort of theme of Nehemiah has really hit home over and over again? Yeah, I think I we've you know been exploring the idea of a return. Mm-hmm. Nehemiah is a return to the ways of God, ultimately to the work of God and reminding, um, you know, remembrance. Who is God? What has he done? How have we fallen away? How have we turned? And how can we turn back again? And so holiness, I think, is at the top of that list. Um, repentance uh, and remembrance. Like I said, I think celebrating the the core themes of the character of God. And a song like Holy, Holy, Holy. This is who you are. You are matchless. There is none like you. And as soon as I forget that, in my life, I turn down a dark alley. And uh, those are the the hardest times of life. And so um, I think that's that's probably the core there, is a remembrance um, of God's character and his work, what he has accomplished. And so obviously we live in the new covenant. And so... Remembering the work of God today is different than remembering the work of God for Nehemiah Mm -hmm. because they hadn't seen the Messiah revealed in the physical sense yet, and we have. What a joy to live on this side of the cross. And so um, to incorporate that, even like this last weekend, singing hallelujah for the cross, we praise God for this torture tool of the enemy that was redeemed by the power of our God to show once and for all, that he is who he says he is. And so it all points back to that, right? The beginning, the foundation, that God is who he says he is. He will accomplish his way. And the best life that we can live is the life that's actually inside of his will. So these things that he instructs us towards are for our good. And when we fall away, it's for our detriment. So he's not a cosmic killjoy. He is the God who knows better than me. Yeah. No doubt. I think you're right on. You know, we had Zerubbabel and Ezra, and Ezra specifically was about sort of establishing the the things of God again within the temple, mm-hmm. the returning of that. And then we have Nehemiah, who's in charge of the safety of the people of God around the walls, sort of establishing the boundaries once again of this returning. 
and they cross paths in chapter eight and we get a great spot where they're called to um, come together and hear the five books of the law, right? Yeah. And I think that we talk a lot about the spiritual journey is about remembering. Um, and that's one of our spiritual acts that we do as people of God's remember. And Nehemiah, through the first seven, seven books, is helping people remember who God is yeah. through the building of the wall, Ezra's doing it in his book. And they sort of, the worlds collide here Yeah. Um, in chapter eight. So we sang the doxology we did. this week. One of the most ancient uh, hymns we have. Yeah. There's, I think, one more that's actually a little older, but the doxology is pretty close. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. And I, I recognized from Amy Drake this weekend that uh, we may have sung it wrong. Because it sounds like at your your small group on a weekly basis, you guys sing it every week. We sing it quite often, and you sing it twice, and we only sing it once, Jay. Yeah, yeah you're you're. It's historically been sung twice. See, and, and with the is, amen at the end at the second one. Yeah, that's a practice of the doxology, and I sing it occasionally at Calvary when I close out a service yeah. when I get a chance, uh-huh. especially around Thanksgiving or Christmas or 130 days of prayer. I close out with that. Um, and I do that at, in the family, my family, the the McClellans and the Ewings, we close it out there Beautiful. on those special holidays and moments. We're all together. And I think it's, I love that song because I know so many faithful believers has sung it for so long. Mm-hmm. And so when I sing it, I'm not singing it just by myself. I'm singing with generation after generation. Totally. Almost, I think to the 400s or 500s? I maybe even the 300. I forget the sort of the date of it. Sure. My producer will tell me in a couple <laughs> seconds. <laughs> well, Mark Wicks in the room. I'm the pastor of worship but, arts, and I should know. But but it's, a, it's a, such a beautiful thing to remember that there's been so many faithful people right, that we stand on shoulders of. Completely. And, and that's what that song even alludes to, right? We yeah. praise God from whom all blessings flow. Right. Creatures here below. Right. And above ye heavenly hosts, and the the saints that have gone before us that now get to face to face praise God. Yeah, what a beautiful thing! It's a glimpse of. I think that's the way that I've been thinking about our our corporate Sunday morning gatherings a lot lately. Is the beauty of the fact that what we're doing is a glimpse of eternity in mm-hmm. this heavenly dwelling that we uh, we get to look forward to. That all the oh, saints I couldn't agree gathered more. around the throne. Faces bowed down to the ground to sing, holy, holy, holy. How yeah. worthy is our God to receive all glory, honor, and blessing. I mean, yeah. what a beautiful thing. I think the curse of American Christianity is that it doesn't have that in mind. Mm. It's an individual discovery, new thing. When actually you are joining in with hundreds of thousands, millions of people yep. who have come before you who have sung these songs, who have lived these lives with God. Yep. And we, like you're saying, when we come in on Sunday morning, it's not like get a great donut and coffee and, you know, settle into something new. We actually settle into something old yep. um, that we do together. And then also highlights what you're saying. I think it's a great alluding to we are participating in what we will do in heaven. Yeah. which is be together in the throne room of Jesus. And what is actively happening. Right, currently, right. right, no doubt. Currently, like, eternally. The, the craziest thing. Uh, obviously, God exists outside of our space and time, but he entered in and we get to participate in that alongside the echoed praise of generations of those who have seen the living God and responded. And mm-hmm. What a gift. What a gift. What a gift. What do you think, Mark? 16, 74, is that? It's a lot later than we yeah. thought. Oh, my goodness. I thought it was way older than that. That is much later. That is way much later than I yeah. thought. Well, Still, nonetheless. Go. Yeah, nonetheless. You wonder, will will the songs of our day yeah. still be sung 500 years from now? And um, if so, why? Yeah. Well, that's an even better question. Why? Yeah. What has stood this test of time? Yeah. Yeah. And Look why? at the creed. I think that's another one of those songs for me that has been so great because it it just it outlines the story of 
our faith. Yeah. What right? a great new song in the last couple of years, We Believe. Ugh, yeah. yeah, and it, taking a that song of old and being able to sort of put it in this modern context right. has been it's been sweet. Yeah, it's been right? sweet. Those songs that just simply again tell the story of God, mm-hmm. speak to Scripture, and don't stray far into the mm-hmm. the me territory. Yeah, like our, it's it's interesting, right? Because to remove us doesn't doesn't make sense right when it comes to worship because we are part of god's story and and he values us is that's obvious and in the corporate setting yeah there's just nothing like singing about the character yeah no doubt you see in the psalms too like me and i are there in the psalms oh these are the ones they sung together then too percent so it's not about that. It's actually about the character of God, the story of God. Yep. And something, you know, they've done research on this, on like what solidifies faith or what grows the sort of area of your brain which produces faith. Like they've studied this neurologist. And singing, singing your faith is one of the most for- formative things. We've always known that. Yeah. The scriptures talk about it. Sure. But science is confirming it. Isn't you know that what I mean? fun? <laughs> so like, you're catching like, up with these yeah, thoughts of old. And it's like, my goodness, how amazing is it that the Lord has put the mechanism of song, story, yeah, to the human heart to help solidify our faith. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing, and that we're instructed towards it in Scripture. That music is not a new thing; it's not a new expression, mm-hmm. but it echoes from again the beginning of scripture that god breathed he spoke the mm-hmm. earth into existence i don't think that language is accidental no. that god spoke the earth into existence that a sound wave has always been part of his design mm-hmm. and uh, that idea of communication even that we are communicating with the most high god and right. that he hears us right. when we do it yeah, it's a singing faith. It's a, it's singing. a beautiful thing, and it's a yeah. rare thing these days, yeah. right? I think that's what I uh, am reminded of too often, that people new to the gathering especially might walk in and go like, what is this? Because mm-hmm. where else, apart from a karaoke bar, are you hearing people collectively? Maybe a concert. You go to a concert. Maybe a T-Swift concert. <laughs> 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 maybe a Bono, U2 concert, Grateful Dead, Absolutely. maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. But on a regular basis, yeah, on a know. weekly basis, to gather friends and neighbors and family together and lift your voice. Not for the sake of performance. And I love the fact that Calvary is a singing church. That's right. very unique, too. Mm-hmm. I, uh, <laughs> uh, against the advice of many audiologists, keep one of my in ear monitors out on a weekly basis. And I've tried. I've tried to lead with both in, and it's just too difficult for me mm-hmm. because I can't hear the people. Right. And I think I miss out uh, when I can't. Um, you know, we put microphones in the room where you can put some of that volume into our in-ear monitors. But, man, even this last weekend, singing doxology where it was stripped down, mm-hmm. And to hear the volume of the people. I mean, and that's what we're told in the Psalms that we encourage one another. And that this isn't, uh, remind people often, this isn't us performing for you right. and hoping that you like it. No, 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 no. We are encouraging one another with the truth of who God is and what He has done yeah. by lifting our voices in unity because we're gathered in unity, right? Yeah. And it's a unifying practice. And, um, one that just moves. So music is just one of those things that goes beyond our (laughs) explanation Mm -hmm. in terms of the power of it. And I know that there are plenty of people who are moved more by music than others. Um, But it's a sweet moment. And what a sweet way to close a service this last weekend to be able to do that and just breathe, take it in. It's it's such a gift. I get the best seat in the house. I tell people all the time. Yeah. I, I I can imagine you do actually. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, with Nehemiah, what's something that just in your personal life has been a, a new reality of Nehemiah that mm-hmm. you haven't thought about or bumped into yeah. as you sit and listen to the word of God? Yeah, I think that idea of repentance for me is one that I've been thinking upon a lot lately mm. and obedience. And I think those two are obviously inextricably linked. Um, but reminded in Proverbs that the righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up. And I love that Nehemiah um, is a story of that, reminding the people, look, this is who we are. This is who God is. This is where we have strayed. Let us return again to honor God, but let us be reminded that God's decrees, his law, his way, his instruction is for our benefit. Again, the God who knows better than me. He is the God who perfectly designed creation to operate and uh, allows us the opportunity to see it and live into it. And so um, to to be able to to sit in the sorrow of sin Mm-hmm. to place that before Jesus and say, thank you for forgiveness mm-hmm. that I can without offering animal sacrifice, trust in the power of your death, your burial and your resurrection, mm-hmm. return to you again and find a faithful God who remains the same regardless of my unfaithful mind tongue and behavior Mm -hmm. is uh, it just it's it right like if i if i don't pray for forgiveness if if i don't confess my sin if i don't think upon the sorrow and the grief of um, my darkness my turning then praise is really less powerful Mm -hmm. right right until I can connect with my need for God, then all of it feels pretty meaningless. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's what's difficult a lot of times, even as I think on evangelism, is I can't move somebody towards their sense of total depravity, right? Mm-hmm. God does that. And when that happens, and it happens again and again, uh, it's a good thing, yep. right? Totally. It's It's, I think... Uh, often, too often in my Christian journey, I've um, not spent enough time there in sorrow, in grief, and um, those practices are, as I'm reminded through this book, they are ways to bolster the gratitude for who God is and what he has done and the ultimate forgiveness, the total forgiveness that we find in the work of Jesus on our behalf. That's so good, Scott. That's so good. What a great reminder. You know, it it sums up what I think Nehemiah, we were getting to this week, is like our true strength is found in the joy of the Lord. Yeah. And you only understand that joy when you don't have it. Yeah. When it's absent. Like John Foreman wrote, the shadow is the thing that proves the sunshine. Yeah, and he no, stole no. that from somebody. Oh man, what a what a good who. boomerang to that conversation. Yeah. But that I'm um, that's it, right? I don't I I can't experience the true depth of our faith without experiencing the fullness of the story. And that's why those songs of the creed and holy, holy, holy that that speak to our faith, you know, it yeah. in a five minute song, you can't in its entirety. But in a very holistic sense shows you the story yeah. start to finish. And every part of that story matters totally. towards moving us forward. And that's, uh, that's Nehemiah, right? This right. is where we were. Let us not forget and let us move forward mm-hmm. towards the, the journey that God has laid before us. Mm-hmm. And when we fall, we surely will. And when we experience hardship and when we experience darkness we turn again to yeah, god and we right. seek him and the beauty of the promise is we find him mm-hmm. what a gift what i a mean gift. the promises of god like they just have to hold on tighter and tighter 
and recognize that as I do, he's the one that's holding on to me. He's the author. Yeah. He's the perfecter of my faith, not me. Mm-hmm. So it's all praise. The whole, the whole spiritual life is an act of worship, right? Yeah. Romans. Paul well, reminds us. I love it. I think, you know, your depth of where Nehemiah has been and where we are as a people has been super encouraging to me today. I'm super thankful for this conversation. I'm thankful for your heart towards the Lord, towards the people of God, towards Calvary. Mm-hmm. Thankful we get to do it together. Calvary, I'm so grateful for you. I just want to end our day with um, the Psalm of Ascent. Uh, 131 it says our lord oh lord my heart is not lifted up my eyes are not raised too high i do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me but i have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother like a weaned child in my soul within me and then he says oh israel hope in the lord from this time forth and forevermore And that's what we do today, Calvary. As you go about your day, we are hoping in the Lord this time and forevermore. And we are reminded of that in the book of Nehemiah once again, that Jesus is on his way. The gates in which Ezra reads the text, Jesus will walk through. And we're reminded today that today we live by faith and we will together forevermore. And so enjoy your day. Have a great start of the summer season, and we look forward to the conversation next week as you join us here on the weekly. Have a great day.